Their culture has been shaped by nature and the seasons in their northern home, the island of Hokkaido. Over the last century, Japan's indigenous people have seen their language, their traditions stripped away along with their ancestral lands. But change is in the air. I'm Harry Fawcett. On this edition of 101 East, we ask whether government action and a new spirit of activism can bring the Ainu in from the cold to take their place in modern Japan. On frozen Lake Akan in eastern Hokkaido, Ainu women perform a crane dance. They depict birds teaching their chicks to fly, symbolizing the passing of knowledge to the next generation. A tradition which was important to their ancestors has become to modern Ainu, Japan's indigenous people, a matter of cultural survival. Hideo Akibe is Akan's leading Ainu rights activist. As Japan's new Democratic Party government charts a course towards a new set of Ainu policies, he says it's time for the nation to make up for its attempt to annihilate a culture. There is no generation that speaks the Ainu language. It is disappearing. This must be attended to immediately. This is the biggest crime committed by the Japanese government. But in order to do this, there needs to be aid, or rather, it's a matter of compensation. The Ainu way of life has always been deeply rooted in nature. Their belief system reveres all things, animals, trees, lakes and mountains, as inhabited by spirits. Their language, spoken, not written, passed from parent to child. But since their island was effectively annexed by Japan in the 19th century, and a law passed in 1899 banned their language and their hunting and religious practices, Ainu culture became little more than a historical curiosity. Ainu culture was stopped, frozen, for nearly 150 years. That's because the Japanese government suppressed it. Now we are in the age of trying to regain it for ourselves as quickly as possible. In her small home in Hokkaido's biggest city, Sapporo, Shinobu Sugiura makes her living as she's always done. A proud Ainu, she says, creating handicrafts for sale to tourists. But it wasn't always pride that she felt. Like many, she married outside her community. <laughs> No, he was not an Ainu. I thought I would never get married to another Ainu. That is because I didn't want my children to be bullied like I was. Her son, a part-time nature guide, says the level of discrimination she faced may have ebbed, but it's left behind something almost as damaging, ignorance. Hokkaido people ask us what is Ainu, when I actually go walking down the main street in Sapporo. Sapporo people come up to me and ask me what ethnic group we are. I hope that sort of thing will disappear. Many Ainu activists say a focus on educating the wider Japanese population about their history is a priority. I haven't really thought about it, I'm sorry. I haven't really met them in person, so there are things we just don't know. They are not really known, but I think they are an ethnic group who really preserved their traditions. So I think their rights and so on should be protected. There's ignorance too about something as basic as the number of Ainu living in Hokkaido. The local government's best guess is 24,000. Despite piecemeal attempts to improve their situation, such as an Ainu-specific 1974 welfare program, Ainu living standards have lagged behind those of other Japanese. The latest figures suggest the number of Ainu households on welfare payments is twice the national average. 
In comparison to Japan as a whole, Hokkaido is not a region that is economically strong. But even in comparison to Hokkaido, we learn that Ainu's economic standing and income were lower. Another major problem is the education continuance rate. Up to high school, the rate is about the same as the rest of the Japanese people. But in terms of the university enrollment rate, it is less than one-third of Hokkaido's residents. Slowly, it seems, Japan has been readying itself to confront the issue. In 1997, a Cultural Promotion Act replaced the forced assimilation law of a century earlier. In 2008, the Japanese Diet officially recognized the Ainu as Japan's indigenous people and instructed a panel of experts to carry out research. And last month, a new panel held its first meeting, attended by the Prime Minister, Yukio Hatoyama, Five of its 14 members are Ainu. It's aimed to devise a comprehensive set of policies to address Ainu claims, among other things for land access, educational assistance, and funding for Ainu language teaching. The trouble for the government is that no one group can claim to speak for the Ainu. The membership of the Hokkaido Association is at best 50% of the island's Ainu population, and many more live beyond Hokkaido's shores. Makiko Urakawa is one of them. In western Tokyo, she supplements her part-time social work income with a business roasting coffee beans, feeling a connection to the Ainu god of fire as she works. The daughter of a veteran political activist, she says her hopes for the new panel are qualified by the history of the Ainu experience in the greater Tokyo or Kanto area. <laughs> I know in the Kanto area are still not fully recognized. There is dissatisfaction about that. But as we find ourselves today, there is a movement in the Kanto area that is trying to voice our thoughts. They are finally finding their voice. The official estimate for the number of Ainu living in Greater Tokyo is 2,700, but many believe the true figure to be at least double that. And while the powerful Ainu representatives of Hokkaido have in the past secured cultural and financial provisions for their people, the Tokyo Ainu have had nothing. There's no Hokkaido on mainland. Ainu live all the way down to Okinawa. So the matter is not about being outside Hokkaido. Regardless of where you are, the same policy that is being implemented in Hokkaido should apply to all Ainu. Otherwise, it wouldn't mean anything. Despite the fact that they're all Ainu, depending on where they live, there's been a large disparity in their treatment. And Tokyo Ainu have had a strong sense of dissatisfaction about that. That dissatisfaction has been directed towards the government, but also because of their lack of support for their Tokyo brothers, towards the Ainu Association of Hokkaido as well. Koji Yuki understands the Tokyo-Hokkaido distinction better than most. For years, he lived in Japan's capital, not admitting to his Ainu identity. A decade ago, a growing political awareness brought him back to Hokkaido, where he now makes woodblock art, not a traditional Ainu form. Usually, old things are introduced as Ainu traditions, but I think it is possible to give shape and create new expressions with an ancient spirit the kind of spirit that has been handed down over the ages. I think that my work is a window. He says reinvigorating Ainu culture as an evolving living thing, not a frozen ideal, is vital. But so too is what comes out of the current political process. There are those who stress the importance of building an educational system for learning Ainu culture as well as an apology for Japan's past policies. I'm also calling for a distinct recognition of the history. These, I think, are key issues. We are the last developed country to move towards indigenous people's rights. For Koji Yuki and his fellow Ainu Art Project members, a new generation needs to reclaim and reshape its cultural heritage. But much too depends on the wider Japanese nation, the same nation which colonized their island, all but killed their language, and for so long denied their rights, providing the Ainu with the means to recover.
Coming up after the break on 101 East, we hear from Japan's most senior Ainu representative and from the man the Japanese government has charged with formulating the new Ainu policy. Stay with us. Welcome back to 101 East, where we've moved from Hokkaido to Tokyo to be joined by Tarashi Kato, head of Japan's most powerful Ainu body, the Ainu Association of Hokkaido. Thank you very much for your time on the program today. Um, let me start by asking you what you want from this process. It seems that a lot is already being done for the Ainu people in terms of education, in terms of, of welfare provision. What extra thing is critical in terms of the, the, this process going forward? In the past, although various measures were taken, they were superficial measures and they did not substantially improve Ainu living conditions or their education. This time, I believe that neither education nor living will work out if it does not proceed under distinct laws for an ethnic group. In that sense, I personally think that the panel will, in terms of making progress with Ainu issues, direct us in a favorable way. But Surely you have a list of concrete things that you want to achieve. What, what, what are the set policies that you really want to eventuate from this? This panel is tackling Ainu issues for which nothing was done for 140 years. The idea is to start working on it, so nothing has been touched upon just yet. We have narrowed down our focus on what to do, and as a start, I think there is going to be a task force for devising laws, and upon that, another task is to create living space, symbolic space for the Ainu people. But what about the idea of some sort of formal acknowledgement, a big gesture from the Japanese government, an apology for the years of, of what you say is mistreatment of the Ainu people? I don't think that apologizing will solve all the issues. Come to think of it, when Ainu were recognized as the indigenous people, although the word apology was not used, they have apologized. They say that the Japanese government must solemnly accept the fact that they gave severe treatment to Ainu in the past. But one of the things that, that your association is saying is that there needs to be a wider Japanese recognition of what happened, more engagement by Japanese society as a whole. Wouldn't an apology shock the Japanese society in, into trying to engage more with your people? Well, in my opinion, it won't be good if they apologize and that is going to be the end of it. I also don't think that an apology will let the public learn anything about the Ainu. Rather than requesting an apology or demanding to give us rights, I think it's better if the government first takes responsibility in trying to work on Ainu issues that have been abandoned for 140 years. And so the future, um, in terms of, of educating the wider Japanese uh, populace about what happened in your history, how, how do you go about that? I think there are various methods. In the 29th July report published last year, although at the time of the new Ainu law, there was little mention of Ainu history. There were 17 pages dedicated to describing Ainu history and the hardship that they were subjected to. In that sense, letting the public read the report may be one way of edification and enhancing their understanding. But some in, in the Ainu community say that that kind of ambition doesn't really represent what they really want. Um, Hokkaido University did some research which found the top two issues were educational support, better educational support, and better support in terms of getting jobs. Shouldn't you be focusing on those things? I think those issues are very serious. But I think discrimination is an even more serious issue. A current survey by the Hokkaido University indicates that there is disparity. On this issue too, the panel wants to do a survey for the purpose of making relevant laws and to work on education and living issues. But what should come first, I believe, is making laws and making laws specifically for the ethnic group. Another issue of representation is the, is the difference between the Ainu living in the Tokyo, the, the Kanto area, and those living in Hokkaido. Um, some say that as the most powerful Ainu organization, 
you've concentrated far too much on those living in Hokkaido and left those in the Kanto region behind. Shouldn't you be, be doing more to unify the representation for all of the Ainu people? That is right. Previously, there was no policy for Kanto region or Tokyo region. This time, it is going to expand beyond Hokkaido, and that is what is going to be taken under consideration. So you've, you've been to the first meeting of this new panel. Uh, what was your impression and, and how confident are you that it will actually progress to, to fruition with, with proper concrete policies which will help your people? The impression of the panel was great. The Prime Minister himself attended the meeting and expressed strong enthusiasm in his government leading the process. The Cabinet Secretary General said the same and that they will work hard to make things happen. I personally believe that from now on, there will be progress made on Ainu issues. But it's taken a very long time to get to this point. If, if it is as, 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 as significant a point as you say it is, what explains the, the long history and, and the long ignoring of, of your people by the Japanese nation? I think there are various reasons. To put it simply, I think democracy prioritizes the thoughts of the majority. The majority is not supporting the minority ethnic group, but rather expected it to assimilate and then disappear. The Ainu were disregarded. I think this is why it took so long until now. Tadashi Kato, thank you very much for coming on the program. An opportunity now to put some of the points that we've heard from the Ainu representatives to the man that the Japanese government is charged with steering the process towards a, a new Ainu law. Uh, Katsuya Ogawa, thank you very much for joining us on 101 East. Um, firstly, perhaps we could ask you, your government is newly in power, but in terms of the Japanese nation, why do you think it's taken so long for this point where a comprehensive settlement for the Ainu people is on the cards? <laughs> I think there are various reasons. The UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People pushed the diet. Before that, until the last of the 20th century, there were unthinkable laws such as the Hokkaido Aborigine Protection Act. It finally began to move after the upper house election three years ago, where half of the national diet's power balance changed. There was a resolution on indigenous people the expert panel produced various reports, and now, after the change in the government, we are stepping into a new form. As to why it took so long, I suppose the awareness of the Japanese people and the government was outdated. And, and why do you think the Japanese people haven't had a, a proper conception of who the Ainu are and what their value to Japan is? I am originally from Hokkaido, but for those who live in other regions, I don't think there are opportunities to encounter them. Also, I am ashamed to say, even though I lived in Hokkaido, there was little opportunity to get to know them. Until I was 18, I had zero Ainu acquaintances or friends. Due to these circumstances, Ainu are only mentioned in the corner of a textbook, and that's why public awareness didn't grow. One way to um, alleviate that, surely, would be for a, an official public acknowledgement of the state's wrongs to the Ainu people, as they would see it, as many would see it over the, the past hundred years and more. That's something that you could give them now, isn't it, even before a panel process takes place? Hmm. Giving an apology is not the purpose of the panel. It's to create a committee that can discuss what can be done from now on. But an apology would be a very public gesture and it would potentially encourage people to learn more and, and do all the other things that are necessary. Um, it certainly made a big difference in Australia to the way that the Aboriginal people felt about, uh, about their history. Why not do it in Japan? That may occur as the government makes various decisions, but primarily the policy panel will proceed with the wishes of the Ainu people to create a symbolic space. 
and they would like a living condition survey conducted on Ainu living outside Hokkaido. So, so let's move on to some of those specifics then. The, the Ainu people we've spoken to say that it's very important both that they have more educational assistance, that their standards of living is, is raised up to the point where they can really take a, a greater part in, in Japanese life. What sorts of things, obviously the panel is just beginning, but what sorts of things is on the agenda for the Tokyo administration to, to put in place? Economic support or related policies have been done by previous governments. In particular, the Ainu want to strengthen education. There is a distinct disparity in the education continuance rate, and we are receiving their earnest wish to let as many people as possible get higher education. And what sort of concrete measures um, would need to take place to, to, to make those improvements? There was a request for more scholarships. Our government has already decided to distribute child allowances, offer free high school education, and enhance grants for universities. These are not specially for the Ainu, but as a whole, we are considering major increases in the education budget. So it will be a matter of discussion to decide what more is necessary. Also, going to school is not just a matter of paying school fees. We'll also consider other aids such as commuting and living. So finally, the Ainu people have, have waited a very long time for their proper place in Japanese society to, to be made real. How much longer do you think this process is going to take and what will success look like for you at the end of it? The Hatoyama government has just come into power. During the four-year term, I personally hope to see a degree of development regarding this issue. As for the new panel, they're setting a time limit of one year to consider Ainu issues and will start formulating policies after that. I'm hoping to give it some kind of shape within four years of the election. Well, we'll be watching that with interest. Thank you very much for your time, Katsuya Ogawa, here on the program. Uh, that's it from the team here in Japan for this edition of 101 East. Thanks for watching and goodbye.